Now that you're feeling confident about the clinical presentation and diagnosis of bronchiolitis, let's jump into management so you know how to best take care of these kids. The good news is that for the most part, bronchiolitis is a self-limited infection. There's a surprising variability in the clinical management of bronchiolitis, despite updated, evidence-based AAP clinical practice guidelines. Pursuing interventions and therapies that aren't recommended has been associated with an increased length of hospital stay and no change in readmission rate. So, keep those AAP guidelines handy as you head onto the wards and into peds clinics. And remember that evidence-based treatment is the way to go. The very first step in your management plan is to evaluate the severity of your patient's illness. During your history and physical exam, pay careful attention to hydration, respiratory status, and oxygenation to determine whether hospitalization, represented by the Red Cross on this tombstone, is indicated or if your patient is safe to stay at home. Indications for hospitalization include dehydration, respiratory distress, apnea, lethargy, a toxic appearance, and an oxygen saturation less than 90 to 95 percent on room air. Keep in mind that you'll want to reassess these kids a few times before making a decision, as the clinical exam can change over time. The most important takeaway from this lesson today is that the mainstay of treatment for bronchiolitis, whether hospitalized or at home, is supportive care kind of like the supports on this treehouse. For the majority of previously healthy infants with bronchiolitis, there's no indication for the use of medications as part of your management plan. Take note of this treehouse sign to remind you, no meds allowed. There's no reason to routinely give bronchodilators, racemic epinephrine, inhaled or oral glucocorticoids, leukotriene inhibitors, or antibiotics to patients with bronchiolitis. None of these treatments have been shown to have benefit. They are all associated with increased costs and could result in adverse effects. Similarly, chest physiotherapy, also called chest PT, is not recommended for patients with bronchiolitis, as there's a no proven benefit and it could result in your patient becoming more agitated and distressed. For hospitalized patients with more severe disease, there are a few other options you can think about. But for the most part, these kids just need time and supportive care too. All patients with bronchiolitis should be placed on contact precautions, including gowns, gloves, and a mask, like these ones you see hung up in the treehouse, to help prevent the spread of viral infection. Nasal suction, often provided in combination with saline nasal drops, is commonly used to help relieve nasal obstruction and can be pretty helpful. It's depicted here by this ghostly dust buster in the treehouse. I wonder if the ethereal HEPA filter is good at getting ectoplasmic goo. Uh, just know there's not enough evidence for a formal recommendation one way or another on its use, and make sure to avoid deep suctioning, as it can actually be harmful. You can also try nebulized hypertonic saline in the inpatient setting but it should not be used in the emergency department setting. Monitoring oxygenation status is important for patients with bronchiolitis. It's generally recommended that for stable patients, intermittent oxygen saturation checks should be performed rather than continuous monitoring to avoid the unnecessary use of supplemental oxygen. You can see this represented by this ghost's glowing red human detector ring. Of course, if your patient has severe respiratory distress or is admitted to the ICU, then that's a different story and you'll need more thorough monitoring. If your patient's oxygen saturation dips below 90%, then the use of supplemental oxygen, depicted by this giant green O2 tank, is indicated and can be administered via typical nasal cannula, high-flow nasal cannula, or even CPAP if they need a higher level of support. Intubation may be necessary in severe cases with impending respiratory failure, which is usually manifested by severe retractions, poor or no air entry, lethargy, fatigue, and decreased responsiveness. Patients with bronchiolitis are at an increased risk for dehydration, so you'll need to monitor their I's and O's closely. Small, frequent feeds are recommended in stable patients if their respiratory status allows.
Initiation of NG feeds, represented by this nose picker, or IV fluids, represented by the fluid bag-like icicle hanging from the IV vine and dripping water, may be necessary if respiratory distress limits their PO intake, puts them at risk of aspiration if they are vomiting, or their urine output has dropped off. All patients with bronchiolitis, whether at home or hospitalized, will also need frequent monitoring with continual reassessment for the need to escalate or de-escalate care. For hospitalized kids, most pediatric hospitals have bronchiolitis treatment pathways based on AAP guidelines that can be super helpful. In addition to the treatment options we've talked about, it's important to address prevention and risk reduction strategies too. Smoking cessation, good hand hygiene, note the wash sink in the treehouse, and breastfeeding, like this opossum mama is doing, should all be encouraged, since these can help reduce the severity of symptoms and the spread of infection. RSV immunoprophylaxis with palivizumab, also called Synergis, represented by this super pale high-risk ghost sitting next to an antibody-shaped tree branch, is recommended for only a small subset of high-risk patients under one year of age, including preemies born at less than 29 weeks gestation and infants with bronchopulmonary dysplasia or hemodynamically significant cardiac disease. Guidelines and eligibility criteria for palivizumab change yearly, so be sure to check each winter. This is a highly expensive medication, but... It does help reduce the risk of hospitalization for RSV infection in these kiddos. For many patients, the bronchiolitis clinical course is relatively uncomplicated. But you still need to know about potential short- and long-term complications to watch out for, so let's quickly review them. Remember that infants with severe disease, and especially those with underlying conditions, are at a higher risk for complications. As we mentioned earlier, patients with bronchiolitis are at risk for aspiration pneumonia due to their tachypnea and increased work of breathing. Check out these two ghosts in the corner. They're super freaked out by the sight of a real human in their woods, so much so that one's vomited all over the lung shirt of his buddy. Infants who are struggling with significantly increased work of breathing generally need to be made NPO and provided with enteral or IV hydration to minimize the risk of aspiration. Patients with severe bronchiolitis may progress to respiratory failure and require intubation and mechanical ventilation, represented by this laryngoscope flashlight. Huh. You'd think a ghost wouldn't have trouble seeing in the dark. Eh, you know what they say about assuming. From a long-term standpoint, the most common complication of bronchiolitis is the development of reactive airway disease, recurrent wheezing, or asthma. Note the inhaler in this ghost's mouth. The fear of seeing a human has apparently spun his asthma out of control. This asthma risk seems to be higher among patients that had severe bronchiolitis, those younger than six months, and, of course, among patients with a family history of atopy. So... Be sure to let caregivers know that the child might wheeze with future illnesses and remind them to talk to their pediatrician if this does occur. So there you have it. You're now the master of one of the most common infectious diseases you'll see in pediatrics, especially during cold and flu season. Seeing really is believing. Once you've seen your first case of bronchiolitis, you'll never forget the sound of those classic lung findings. So... Before the not-so-friendly ghostly trio shows up, let's take one last look at what we've learned. Bronchiolitis is a self-limited viral illness affecting the lower airway in kids, generally under age 2. It is the most common reason for hospitalization in infants and young children in the USA, and is especially common in the winter months. Bronchiolitis is most commonly caused by respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV for short, but can be caused by other viruses such as rhinovirus, influenza and parainfluenza virus, coronavirus, and more. Bronchiolitis classically presents with one to two days of fever and upper respiratory symptoms such as nasal congestion and rhinorrhea, followed by worsening of symptoms around days three through five with development of lower respiratory symptoms like cough and trouble breathing. The pathophysiology of bronchiolitis involves viral-induced airway edema, increased mucus production, and necrosis and sloughing of airway epithelial cells leading to lower airway obstruction, 
The physical exam in patients with bronchiolitis generally demonstrates signs of increased work of breathing, such as tachypnea, retractions, accessory muscle use, grunting, and nasal flaring, as well as abnormal lung sounds like wheezes and crackles. Luckily, most kids with bronchiolitis do okay. It is generally a self-limiting viral illness, granted a frustrating and scary one for pediatricians and parents alike, that is treated with supportive care. Some kids are at risk for more severe disease. Risk factors include age under 12 weeks, a history of prematurity, chronic lung disease, significant cardiac disease, as well as other social factors, such as daycare attendance, school-aged siblings, limited breastfeeding during infancy, and secondhand smoke exposure. RSV prophylaxis is recommended to help prevent bronchiolitis in a small subset of high-risk infants. Those under one year of age with a history of prematurity less than 29 weeks, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, or hemodynamically significant congenital heart disease. Bronchiolitis is a clinical diagnosis. Labs and imaging studies are not indicated in your run-of-the-mill bronchiolitis case but can be considered in special circumstances like severe illness or an unusual illness course. Treatment of bronchiolitis involves knowing what not to do as much as it is knowing what to do. AAP recommendations include avoiding bronchodilators, antibiotics, glucocorticoids, racemic epinephrine, chest PT, and deep suctioning. These do not improve treatment outcomes and can in fact cause more complications. The mainstay of treatment for bronchiolitis in an outpatient setting includes nasal saline drops and suction, small frequent feeds, and monitoring respiratory status and hydration, as well as other standard supportive care measures. Infants with severe bronchiolitis need to be hospitalized for escalation of care. Indications for hospitalization include dehydration, significant increased work of breathing, especially if you are concerned about respiratory fatigue or apnea, poor oxygenation, and lethargy. Patients who are hospitalized for bronchiolitis may need hydration via enteric or intravenous fluids, frequent suctioning, as well as oxygen support. Respiratory support generally starts with nasal cannula and advances to high-flow nasal cannula, CPAP, or even intubation if needed in severe cases of respiratory failure. Nebulized hypertonic saline is also sometimes tried. Luckily, the vast majority of kids with bronchiolitis, even those who need hospitalization, do well. In the short term, complications of bronchiolitis include aspiration pneumonia and respiratory failure. Those children with severe disease, especially if under six months of age, and those with other comorbidities are at higher risk for developing recurrent wheezing or asthma in the future. And that's it, folks. Our time today is just about up. Hopefully, our ghost hunting friend has enough instant primordial soup mix to go around, or at the very least is... Pretty talented at helping ghosts take care of their unfinished business. Oh, jeez, uh, here comes one now. <laughs> Gotta go. See you next time.